Well, thank you very much for inviting me and for appointing me, foolishly appointing me, an Erskine Fellow. Um, unless I'm very badly mistaken, you're go absolutely everybody's going to really hate this paper today. Uh, it has no econometrics. It contains no multivariate regressions. It's just theory, boring theory, expounded in words, the most inexpressible form of communication. No maths, no econometrics. And it's all about very fundamental concepts. So fundamental that most of us uh, have learned these concepts as students. We teach them to students. We read them in textbooks. And we really don't think about them very much. And to some extent, the purpose of this talk is to uh, make you think about some of them. Uh, hopefully in a critical way. Now, let us leap in. Now, let's just These fundamental theorems, these two fundamental theorems, which you can find in endless textbooks, sometimes not called fundamental theorems, but always stated in some form as a fundamental theorem. And uh, the word theorem is to be taken very seriously. It implies a mathematically demonstrable proposition. So both of them contain propositions which are purported to be uh, capable of being mathematically demonstrated. The first one is, ex is overly familiar to most of us. The second one is a little more mysterious. Okay, that <coughs> the first theorem states that with some exceptions, like and it's fascinating that the list gets longer and longer over the years, externalities, public goods, and economies of scale, with those exceptions, every competitive equilibrium is Pareto optimal. And to some extent, this lecture is all about what that means. Uh, they are very portentous words, and they are full of meaning and significance although not everybody agrees on their precise significance. The second theorem is actually uh, much more difficult to take on board. It's a kind of reverse of the first theorem, that, that whatever the initial endowments of agents, their meaning their capital, their human capital, their abilities, and whatever are the initial property rights, every Pareto optimal allocation can be realized by a competitive equilibrium. Now, if you really think about that, this is a, a far stronger theorem, and on the face of it seems almost preposterous. Uh, but it is an adjunct of the first and it really gives uh, vitality and significance to the first. And we are going to slowly consider the validity of each of these theorems in a philosophical sense and in every other sense. Now, this first, it's just a footnote in the history of economic thought that this these theorems were first stated by Kenneth Arrow, who has been responsible for so many good and bad things in modern economics. Most famously, the impossibility theorem that started a whole branch of economics called uh, social choice theory. But he was also responsible for the first statement, formal statement of these two fundamental theorems. The second theorem was 
stated even earlier by sort of significant, this is, this is just cultural footnotes, by his PhD supervisor, a man called Harold Hotelling, a very famous mathematical economist and statistician, a name that has now been more or less forgotten. But in 1951, Arrow uh, restated these theorems. And in one form or the other, they are stated and restated in every elementary and even intermediate microeconomic textbook. Well, now let's just start with the first theorem. The The first theorem states a so-called, sometimes called Pareto principle. It was, it originates with uh, Wilfredo Pareto, who stated it in 1909. Uh, and it implies three ideas, all of which are arguable. The first is that it's a statement about social welfare, the welfare of the entire society, and it states that social welfare is simply the sum of all the individual welfares, a, a sum total of individual welfares, without any consideration of how they are distributed. That is, without any consideration of whether there are more with less income, more with uh, higher income, more with smaller incomes, without any distributional consideration, add up all the welfare of individuals to reach this, the social welfare. And welfare is to be judged, consumer sovereignty is a shorthand for, in the light, in the opinion of every individual. That is, the individual decides whether he prefers one bundle to another bundle, and that's what defines individual welfare. Uh, and then the social welfare is miraculously simply the sum total of all those individual welfare. So it's still based entirely on the, on the opinions of individuals. Now, obviously this is arguable because we in fact constantly violate it, for example for children, we don't consider uh, children under the age of, and there is no definite age, 16, 17, 18, as having uh, whose opinion really decides what's good for them. Uh, and we exempted for lunatics, uh, the inmates of mental homes. Uh, so we violate it all the time not only in consumer choice, but even in political choice. So it's by no means an unarguable uh, assumption, but it underlies all concepts of Pareto optimality, that it is grounded on uh, individuals' best interests and their own judgment about their welfare. Finally, and most importantly, it implies no comparison of the utility or welfare of individuals. Uh, that's what ICU is shorthand for interpersonal comparisons of utility. Now, this will come up repeatedly in the talk today because this is the bugbear of all welfare economics. Can you actually compare the utility of different individuals to reach something like social welfare. And the genius of Pareto was to find a way of making a statement about social welfare that would not involve interpersonal comparisons of utility, which, being a philosophical positivist, he thought interpersonal comparisons of utility were non-operational, not observable, uh, not measurable by any instruments, and therefore metaphysical. And he, he wanted to define social welfare in such a way 
as to not invoke the metaphysical assumption that you could compare the utilities of different people. Now, there's a whole... This idea that interpersonal comparison and utility are somehow non-scientific uh, entered economics very thoroughly in the 1930s, so thoroughly that many students, for example, even today in classes will say, you can't make interpersonal comparisons of utility as if it's actually impossible. Now, of course, if you could make interpersonal comparisons of utility, it would put an end to all dinner table conversations, which are largely about comparisons of utility. We constantly make interpersonal comparisons of utility, and if you can't make an interpersonal comparison of utility, you're considered autistic and sent to a psychiatrist. So the, question, so the, the, the curious thing is, we do it constantly, but, it, but we have difficulty in agreeing on some objective or intersubjective way of making these comparisons. And there is, in fact, no intersubjective or objective way of making comparisons of utility. And one of the great questions in welfare economics, to which we will return again at the end, is, well, then how do you make such comparisons? Because it turns out that without making such comparisons, there isn't anything significant you can say about social welfare. And the whole history of modern welfare economics is the attempt to get rid of this metaphysical idea of interpersonal comparisons, a, an attempt which was never successful and keeps coming back. Okay, this, we will come back to that. Now, how did, how did Pareto cut through it? He cut through it by realizing that by introducing the concept of perfect competition. Perfect competition, the idea of firms being, there being so many firms and each firm being so small that it cannot have a significant effect on the price by anything it does. All it can really do is take the price of the commodity it sells or produces as given and then make a quantity decision about how much or how little of it to produce. They are, in the uh, uh, immortal words of Thibaut Skutowski, they are price takers and not price makers. Now, when firms are price takers, it turns out that you can go immediately from arguments about exchange between two parties or to a buyer and a seller, to all buyers and sellers. If the most unarguable example of a welfare improvement is an exchange between two people, uh, whatever the price on which they agree to accept the exchange, they would not have accepted that exchange unless they were better off as a result of it. Nobody forced them to enter into exchange so two-party voluntary exchange is the sort of grandfather of a welfare improvement, often called a Pareto improvement, because both parties are better off miraculously at the end of the exchange. Now, if only everybody bought commodities at the same price, of course, people buy different goods, but if they always had to buy those goods at exactly the same price, then you could leap immediately from voluntary exchange between two people to voluntary exchange between n people. Nobody will tra enter into trade unless they are better off as a result of it. That's only true if there is one price for a commodity anywhere in the market. And that's only true under a market structure called per perfect competition. A highly ironic word, because one should really soak in the irony of calling something perfect competition, when it is in fact the kind of competition which both most businessmen regard as 
and that competition at all because it robs the firm of everything except price competition. Now firms like to compete on every dimension, not just price, but on every non-price competition, on every non-price dimension, on location, on, on the quality of the product, on the service provided with the product, on delivery of the product, on advertising with the product. Uh, firms are engaged in rivalry on all dimensions. Perfect competition limits them to rivalry on one dimension, which most businessmen would not accept as a true representation of what is competition. We, in modern economics, call price competition imperfect competition. Now, again, this is extraordinary. It, it happened in the 1930s as a result of John Robinson, the economics of perfect competition, the economics of, uh, what was it called? Anyway, <laughs> the economics of imperfect competition. And we have absorbed this curious and ironic use of the word competition, perfect or imperfect. Uh, and, but I stress that it is only one very small and unusual and rarely observed aspect of competition. Now, this Pareto, by introducing the concept of perfect competition, thought he could make a statement about social welfare uh, in competitive equilibrium without invoking interpersonal comparisons of utility. And having stated it in 1909 in a book called The Manual of Political Economy, no one noticed it. Uh, it, it attracted absolutely no attention and did not enter into economics for another 20 or more years because when Pareto said this in 1909 general equilibrium theory of which this was an aspect was in in decline and uh, was little understood by most economists in the world and it was only in the early 1930s that John Hicks uh, And a number of other economists at the London School of Economics began to revive, Samuelson and Hotelling included, began to revive general equilibrium theory. And in the course of this, Hicks discovered this first fundamental theorem in Pareto's writings. And it's only then that it entered into economics. And very quickly, in four or five years became a kind of canonical doctrine in welfare economics. Thank you very much for reminding me because I meant to say right at the beginning but forgot uh, in my eagerness to get started. Stop me at any point if I say anything that really irritates you. Uh, the minor irritations you have to ignore. But if I say anything that really irritates you or anything mysterious or anything you wish me to elucidate further, stop me at any point at all. Uh, Wait, where is Edgeworth in all this? Edgeworth? Forget it. Uh, <laughs> of course, he, uh, he gets into, uh, in a very complicated way, into the history of wealthy economics. Uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, with a concept of the core of an economy, etc., etc., but it would take us too far af afield to take care of Edgeworth, uh, who, on the whole, never uh, understood the idea of the first fundamental theorem and would have found the, Id the idea of the first fundamental theorem as very paradoxical because he was not afraid, like a lot of 
uh, Marshallians of making interpersonal comparisons of utility. Right, now, the next story in this, in the, we're still on the first fundamental theorem, it was revived in the 1930s. And as it, in, in, in the middle of the 1930s, Lionel Robbins published an extraordinarily significant, influential little book called The Nature and Significance of Economic Science, in which he more or less, he, he didn't only pour cold water on the idea of interpersonal comparisons of utility, he very nearly argued that it was meaningless that one couldn't make these comparisons. They were in any case not scientific. He was a full-blown positivist in a philosophical sense. Uh, and he scared absolutely everybody, I mean the entire economics profession, with the very idea of making an interpersonal comparison of utility which led to a problem. Well, how then can you talk about social welfare? And almost at the same time, in 1939, uh, two uh, British economists, John Hicks again, and Nicholas Caldor, uh, introduced the idea of a potential Pareto improvement rather than an actual Pareto improvement. Uh, now, again, this was later language, but the idea was that Virtually, first of all, they, they thought that the idea of expressing first best Pareto optimality uh, was virtually impossible. And all you could do as a welfare economist was to make second best arguments about changes in the economy and trying to assess their welfare effects. And the example which everybody in the 1930s used was the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846 when Britain went over to free trade and uh, abolished agricultural tariffs which everyone agreed was damaged the income of landlords who had invested in land under the in the belief that they were, uh, there was agricultural protection, but it favored capitalists and uh, workers because it tended to lower real wages. So it, it was an extremely well-known, dramatic example of how an economic change uh, generates not unambiguous welfare conclusions, but gainers and losers. And the idea that Calder and Hicks came up with simultaneously was that, well, if the gainers make gains that are so large that they can actually compensate the losers uh, and indeed bribe them to accept the change, then the change is a potential Pareto improvement. That is, in principle, it's a very simple idea. In principle, if the gain is big enough uh, to compensate the losers, you might have a second best Pareto improvement. You might have an improvement which, uh, at the end of the day, is an improvement in social welfare. Virtually all economic changes involve losers and gainers. There are virtually no economic changes that one can think of that are uh, that do not involve some uh, gainers and losers. And so the idea is that uh, uh, a, an economist might still uh, use the judgment or the, the expressed interests of gainers and losers to compare the gains and the lo losses. The trouble is, of course, that uh, while you, you might in principle uh, talk about a potential Pareto improvement of an economic change, 
the moment you turn it into a, an actual improvement, once you actually invite the gainers to bribe the losers, it's perfectly obvious that what happens is that the gainers will exaggerate their gains and, uh, uh, sorry, the gainers will, will minimize their gains and the losers will exaggerate their losses. There will be strategic bargaining between gainers and losers and then the question immediately arises, well, who is going to decide whether the gain is potentially large enough to, to exceed the losses? And the answer is, of course, that in practice, this is usually done, it's taken right out of the hands of the gainers and losers and is handed to a congressional committee, a parliamentary committee, a, a panel of experts who decide, in fact, whether the gains are large enough to exceed the losses. This is a far cry from the Horatian idea that you would be able to reach a conclusion about social welfare without making an interpersonal comparison of utility. You, what you in fact in practice do, you hand the comparison to a panel of experts. So it doesn't really solve the problem of how you reach a conclusion about social welfare and it's just the first example of how you can never get away from an interpersonal comparison of utility if you're going to say anything significant about a welfare change. Nevertheless, if you will look and consult any textbook on microeconomics on, or on public economics that you possess, you will discover that every one of them, without an exception, employs the idea of potential Pareto improvement to reach a conclusion about welfare in the case of an economic change, which somehow preserves the scientific quality of economics Economists are not making a judgment, they are made by the individuals concerned themselves. Uh, and this is really a, uh, a trick, uh, because in a sense, uh, it isn't left to the individuals themselves, and we never do in fact allow individuals themselves to decide it, because if they do, the end is simply political squabbling, which is precisely what we're trying to avoid by having a fundamental theorem, or by having a formal doctrine of uh, uh, potential Pareto improvement. So, yes. So it seems like there's two issues here. One is this potential Pareto improvement, which doesn't necessarily have to involve the political sector, and therefore the kinds of implementation issues you raise really aren't valid if you think about that dimension of it. And then there's this issue, well, how do we go about implementing that? It seems to me that some of the value, just, just to be argumentative, some of the value of thinking about the world this way is accomplished just when we think about potential Pareto improvements. And then the real issue is do we really buy into utilitarian theory where we can just add up people's utilities? And so the second question in some sense is trying to deal with you know, equity issues or getting people to agree to this. Uh, suppose we do a situation where the, the gains of the winners outweigh the losses of the losers. The losers are all ticked off. Uh, the gainers are happy, and the happiness of the gainers outweighs the losses of the losers. So it's a, it's a potential parental improvement. Now, if we, if we summed up everybody's utilities, society's overall happiness is better. Isn't that still a useful construct for thinking about the world? And I, I guess I'm sad. I think, I think it is. Yes. It's a useful framework for thinking about the problem, but it leaves open the question, as you yourself say, of well, how is it actually implemented? And uh, there is, in fact, leaping ahead of the story, at the end of the day, there is no way in which anyone has ever uh, devised of resolving this question except by uh, allowing gainers and losers to represent themselves politically and by a democratic process in which they can express their opinions about their gains and their losses uh, 
uh, you may not want to call that political squabbling, uh, but some process of democratic decision making is the only way of resolving it. But all one, but I wish to emphasize that this is a long way from why economists have worried about the fundamental theorems because they have, this ends up saying that really uh, wealthy economics in the end turns into political theory and into a political process of representation and how people represent themselves and whether uh, uh, representative representation can really be truly democratic if people don't actually participate in that process. Uh, we get into, we end up uh, pushing wealthy economics into political philosophy and this is precisely what economists have for almost a century struggled to avoid uh, you. Now, this is virtually my own view of the whole issue that there is no welfare economics that isn't political philosophy in the end. See, it seems like you could argue that it's not so much the political philosophy dimension, it's the desire to avoid making interpersonal utility comparisons. Well, and, and I think I agree 100% that at the end of the day, uh, this is not a satisfying way of addressing that issue. That you have to end up making interpersonal Okay, well, that's what I think. But this is a... Uh, do understand what you're, that what you're saying uh, would get you shot at most economic seminars because this flies almost totally in the face of preva prevailing mainstream opinion about these issues, which is we do not wish to push uh, or economics into political science. Uh, um, surely there can be a solution via something like a dominant assurance contract where the gainers of, for, for, I'm thinking say, say something like residential rezoning to allow a shopping mall to be built. Typically that's put into a political process rather than um, a long negotiation. But if we imagine that if we're truly a potentially cradle improving move, shopping malls can send a note to each of the homeowners saying, give us your bid. If the, some of the bids um, or your reservation prices, some of the reservation prices is higher than what we're willing to pay, the project won't go forward, but let us know we want to see if there's a potential gain from trade here. It's all through revealed preference. It doesn't have to go to government to do it. Um, and it only goes through if the gains the gainers are bigger than the losers. I'm confused why we can't operationalize it. I know that we often don't, and it's often subverted by politics, and then we don't get the compensation of the losers, because Teller takes a through parts compensation, but then we never do it. Um, but in principle, we can. And well, you've picked an example in which it looks almost as if there is no gap between practice and principle. Well, in practice, they just expropriate and barely pay a, a compensating value, at least in states. But in principle, you should be able to do it via an insurance contract. Isn't that a very high on transaction cost? I mean, surely. Oh, for uh, residential rezoning, no, but for something like a national policy, perhaps. Well. And then if it goes into the political sphere and if it's determined by lobbying, the losers will bid up to the amount that they expect to lose, with the gainers will bid up to the amount they expect to gain, and we're back at efficiency. That's just Becker. And. and but this is an extremely uh, context-specific example. It, there are examples in which it uh, is, in fact, possible to resolve it in practice. But there are very, very few of these examples. Uh, and as soon as it really involves a large number of people, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult. And to the moment we say, oh, in principle you can do it, and uh, there isn't any argument about the principle. The, uh, the, the, the goes to politics and people lost, give, give bribe to politicians by the amount of their losses or their gains for back to efficiency. Well, is, that's, a, that's sort of the main point. Only if you believe that we can measure, dollar, the dollars measure the happiness or the utility that the respective parts are getting. So it really does come down to utilitarian theory.
of being able to add these things up and making interpersonal comparisons by saying somebody will have been more for something and get more utility from somebody else. Funny. Uh, that, that's probably going a little further beyond because. Well, that's what you have to do. That's what you have to believe is to take it. Second welfare and zero. I'm, I'm sticking on the first. If we have a prior adjustment, then income effects are gone, and it's all just revealed practice again. But the example you gave about the political process doesn't have those prior adjustments. It's people bidding for, uh, for lobbyists and, and bribing them. So uh, I think you do have to buy into the personal input comparisons and, and adding up income as a Yours, yours is the classic uh, uh, mainstream position, that you, you poo-poo all the difference, all the problems of implementing. The, uh, in principle, it's possible, and therefore, you know, in practice, the gap between principle and practice is very small, uh, and uh, there are limited examples where really the gap is indeed small, but there are a large number of examples where the gap is very large. Uh, but this is precisely what it's all about. It, it is this judgment, a judgment that we have to make when we apply welfare economics to particular cases, whether it is really possible uh, to compare gains, gains and losses in these particular examples, or whether we can say, oh, look, we have a general principle we can always apply. And, and, and particularly, we can write it on blackboards. Uh, it's a general, it's possible to formulate it mathematically, or at least in a formal sense, even if we don't do it mathematically. And that's what wealthy economics has been largely about. It has been about stating very precise propositions in a formal manner uh, to get away from individual examples, which are always context-specific, history-specific, country-specific, uh, and require a great deal of information about the particular case you're discussing. But we have, we've run very far ahead of the story. Uh, good, good. Wait a minute, I didn't... The definition of a resident is a serious political problem when you're trying to redistribute wealth. For example, you live in a town where there's university students, or short-term people. Are their views going to be counted? Or is it the property owners who are going to be counted? Or is it the people on the electoral roll? You know, that's the sort of thing that, I, mean, I think you know, there's one saying, well, the term resident seems like it's nice and clean, but because they tried to do this in the West Coast when they're trying to give away money that they had to go back, it's, who can they give it to? Who were the residents? You know, were they the people who lived there two years or ten years? Did they have long-term leases or did they have short-term leases? Were they visitors or were they the corporate people from Moffitt? I'm just thinking that, you know, if you listen to the idea of implementation, I think it's harder because the transaction costs thing, you know, just identifying who were the relevant parties. Yes. Anyway, just, I didn't want to let her, I mean, he just needed to solve it. <laughs> 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 Are okay. there any other questions? Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to skip uh, discussions about uh, Adam Smith because it will take us too far afield except to say that uh, uh, the first fundamental theorem is uh, almost everywhere traced back to Adam Smith who is supposed to have uh, implied the first fundamental theorem without using those precise words. Uh, and uh, in the exposition of wealthy economics in most textbooks, uh, one is, the student is made to see how ancient is the tradition that lies behind wealthy economics. The first fundamental theorem is implicitly stated by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. Now this is a a historical travesty uh, and it's not let me just spend a minute on it because it involves a very big idea which crops up repeatedly in welfare economics Adam Smith uh, stated 
twice over the concept of the invisible hand which when we read it now we invariably associate with the, the price mechanism uh, the market mechanism which works as an invisible hand to harmonize private and social interests and to secure social welfare uh, although individuals only act in their own self-interest uh, but as if by an invisible hand they secure a, a maximization of social welfare the this is a historical travesty because Adam Smith had absolutely no inkling of the first fundamental theorem or any concept of efficiency which is a word that never appears in the wealth of nations but the concept doesn't appear in the wealth of nations what does appear in the wealth of nations is the idea that competition is desirable has desirable properties and by competition he meant not what we call perfect competition or imperfect competition but he meant rivalry between producers and consumers rivalry on every possible dimension uh, and and basically he meant freedom of entry and exit into industries and if producers and consumers would comp rival each other using the dictionary sense of the word competition as in sports between athletes a rivalry between consumers and producers he thought this would what were the desirable properties it would maximize economic growth it would attain the highest possible rate of economic growth which would secure an improvement in the standard of living even of the poorest members of the community and he devoted a whole book in the Wealth of Nations 18th century treatises uh, like the Wealth of Nations were divided in books which were divided in chapters uh, and his the Wealth of Nations is divided into five books and one of the books book three uh, has a, a wonderful archaic title on the different progress of opulence in different countries which translated into modern English is on differences in the growth rates of different countries and it's a hundred pages long and is devoted to demonstrating to the reader a belief which we now find strange to imagine that, that anyone believed this it, it, the attempt of that book is to demonstrate that there had been an improvement in national income in Britain since Elizabeth I basically since 1600 the book is written in 1776 easy year to remember because it's the year of the declaration of independence uh, of the American states uh, so in the last almost 200 years he argued in this book there had been a improvement in national income and not only national income but income per head which most people most readers at the time did not believe uh, and that was essentially his argument on why competition was good for what he called the commercial society what we now call capitalism he called the commercial society so this suggests a fundamental distinction between static efficiency which is secured by Pareto optimal allocation of resources uh, in competitive equilibrium and the growth of income uh, which for lack of a better term I call dynamic progress there is a fundamental difference between static efficiency and dynamic progress because an economy can be extremely inefficient and yet generate very high rates of economic growth which in no time at all will completely overshadow inefficiencies in the economy uh, and contrarywise an economy can be 
highly efficient uh, and yet generate very low rates of economic growth. Now, economic growth is easy to observe ever since the national income accounting. Uh, so everybody knows what is meant by dynamic progress. But the efficiency of an economy is not something you can just observe by looking out of the window. It's actually very difficult to determine whether an economy achieves Pareto optimal allocation of resources. And it's certainly not something you can determine by simple, simple by observation. Uh, so, the, the travesty in crediting Adam Smith with the first fundamental theorem is that the first fundamental theorem is all about efficiency and Adam Smith is all about dynamic progress. And, and the distinction is extremely important in judging, in making welfare comparisons between economic systems, and for example, that are, uh, are arguments in favor of capitalism. One minute. Well, I reached the end of the sentence. Arguments in favor of capitalism is certainly that or ought not to be, that it is always efficient. It's capable of extreme inefficiency, but it is capable of achieving a very high rate of economic growth compared to alternative economic systems. And that is basically the strongest argument for capitalism. But uh, in welfare economics, the argument for capitalism is often something like the first fundamental theorem, that it is statically efficient, which would mean that it generates, for example, no externalities, no economies of scale, no monopoly, etc., etc., etc. No. Okay, so I don't want to mess you up time here, but it just seems like, seems like a, an overstatement to, to completely uh, uh, disentangle the static notion of efficiency from the dynamic notion. I think the logic is very similar in both cases, that resources are directed to their highest value use, and that's true in the static context, and when Adam Smith talks about it in terms of growth, that's what he has in mind, that resources end up going to the people who want them the most. And maybe the story is couched in terms of economic growth, but the logic, the, you know, the, there's, a, there's a logical strand that connects both those two notions of static and, and the dynamic, don't you think? That is a logical. And so to say they're like two different animals, and really we all, he was talking about dynamic, but all the theorems are about static, and that's completely different. That seems like a, seems harsh. It, it is like most of the things I say, a, an overstatement, but it's an extremely, <laughs> But it is an extremely important overstatement. Mm. And, it in, and, that, and it in, it is in, this contrast is implied by practically all com comparative economic systems statements about the merits or demerits of different economic systems. In the efficiency idea is always that it is a zero... Uh, I can't think of the, or the right word, the, a, a zero-sum game uh, in which... Uh, Edgeworth uh, box is zero-sum and it's static. Sorry? The Edgeworth box is not zero-sum and it is static. At the end, when you're... The Edgeworth box is not zero-sum? Both individuals trade, they're both made better off in a one-shot static framework. Okay. Okay, because there is a, because there is no growth in the uh, endowments of each of the two agents. Uh, so you have to think about it. Yes. Once you're at the end. To use my own language, once you're at the end state economic equilibrium, uh, you're then, of course, uh, you're in first best efficiency. Uh, and, it, and it's typical of sort of standard economics to forget about the process by which you actually reach that equilibrium. That is, you minimize the question of how uh, 
you reach equilibrium because all the action is on the nature of that equilibrium once you reach it. Okay. Uh, what is Austrian is that uh, is the process conception of equilibrium that you spend a great deal of time and give a lot of attention to the manner in which uh, a market actually converges on an equilibrium. And that is one of the great contributions of Austrian economics to the thinking about, economic, about equilibrium. And it is also characteristically Smithian. There is far more attention in Adam Smith on the process by which firms and consumers compete and much less attention to what the equilibrium is like when you actually get there. In Adam Smith, it's the market price equals the natural price. It is a statement of long-run equilibrium. He does have that. But very little attention is given to that state, and a great deal of attention is given to the endless jockeying for advantage on the part of consumers and producers. Uh, so I, uh, I do think that uh, it's... The Austrian conception does go back to Smith, and not only Smith, but other. Crawford's history of thought, he's very critical of Smith. Murray Rothbard's history of economics. Now, of course, if you think of Rothbard as a, a typical uh, Austrian economist, he certainly is an Austrian economist, and he was crazy about Mises. But, you know, Rothbard is very strange. Uh, as you know, in his book on Adam Smith, uh, is an endless diatribe against Adam Smith. I mean, he absolutely hated Adam Smith. It, it, it's the most uh, vituperative book ever written on a great economist, and it's sort of fun to read because, precisely because it is so vituperative. But, uh, and yes, if Rothbard is Austrian economics, then of course it would be ridiculous to call Adam Smith a forerunner of Austrian economics. But it's a particular kind of Austrian economics. I mean, Hayek, for example, had tremendous admiration for Adam Smith. Uh, and Hayek is, I think, a much more characteristic Austrian economist than Rothbard. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, more. More. This was another example of cocktail party area edition between Eric and myself. Uh, let us. Where were we? Oh, yes. You can summarize the way in which the history of economic thought has dealt with the maximization of social welfare. Uh, basically, there have been five typical ways of dealing with it. Uh, and the first is to be completely candid about interpersonal comparisons of utility and be outspoken in making them. Now, uh, Pareto, uh, in Paration Wealth the Economics, the one thing you don't do is to rest anything on interpersonal comparisons of utility. And we need a name for a kind of welfare economics which does openly make interpersonal comparisons of utility. And the typical name is that of Arthur Pigou. So Pigou becomes Pigovian, and Pigovian welfare economics, uh, which Pigou uh, was the first person to publish a great textbook on welfare economics in 1922, uh, The Theory of Welfare Economics, and he openly advocated income redistribution in favor of the poor uh, with only the exception of moral hazard. If, that is, any redistribution of income uh, in the direction of uh, greater equality was to be considered desirable unless uh, it involved moral hazard and affected the incentives of the poor or the rich, but unless there was clear evidence 
that it had an incentive effect, he advocated redistributing income in the direction of greater equality. And, uh, and he was so far from trying to avoid interpersonal comparisons of utility, he openly announced his comparison of utility. He never confronted the issue of what happens if you disagree with that uh, particular comparison, uh, which is the issue that we've already started to touch on. Okay, that's, so that's one, that's one way of dealing with the problem of, of how to maximize social welfare, which uh, is uh, absolutely anti-orthodox. Uh, it's not the way in which uh, modern economists have not followed Pigou, they have followed Pareto. The second one is to, uh, to do what Hicks and Calvo did, was to uh, turn a, an actual Pareto improvement into a potential Pareto improvement using a compensation, a compensation test, as it's called, in which the, uh, the gainers uh, bribe the losers to accept the change. And In a, in a very complicated way, which I can only sort of touch on lightly, Hicks, who is the most important person in this story, uh, picked up from Marshall the idea that you could use, you could actually statistically estimate uh, the so-called consumer surplus and producer surplus consumer surplus under the demand curve, the producer surplus under the supply curve, to estimate the gains and losses of losers and gainers. Uh, and provided uh, it was actually possible to estimate demand curves and supply curves, uh, this almost turned the compensation payment into something which could be decided by statisticians uh, instead of asking uh, gainers and losers to make the estimate. This, this sort of reconciles the old uh, Marshallian welfare economics with the uh, new Pareto welfare economics. That's a second uh, way of maximizing social welfare, which, uh, which indeed uh, received some endorsement and is mentioned in lots of textbooks. The third way, which uh, is associated with the name of Samuelson, is to employ something called a social welfare function. Now, this is one of these wonderful, uh, instead of calling it an interpersonal comparison of utility, you call it a social welfare function. The social welfare function is essentially a set of weights applied to the income of individuals. And if you have such weights, you can, of course, add them all up. You no longer add them up equally. You weigh some of them more heavily than others. Uh, this idea is associated with the name of Abram Berkson, who invented it and was then picked up by Samuelson, and Samuelson advocates it in all of his writings, uh, and it is never explained how, where this social welfare function comes from. And it is really, uh, once again, this idea that there are politicians, or there is a government, or there, are, there is a state uh, which somehow makes these decisions independently of individuals. Uh, the Economist hands the uh, interpersonal comparison of utility made in principle to a government which then makes it in practice. The, the, fourth, the fourth way of dealing with social welfare is uh, associated with the name of Amartya Sen, which is to completely this is extremely unorthodox and very radical, to throw away completely the idea of utility. 
and the idea of maximizing utility and to focus instead on what individuals themselves said claims uh, value as part of their well-being and he uses a sort of a shorthand, he calls it uh, their capabilities. Their their capabilities are the, their abilities to provide themselves with the, with good health, good housing, good food, education for their children, uh, okay, medical care, a number of functionings, as he calls them, that enter into uh, the well-being of individuals. Uh, again, it is a individualist approach. He assumes people themselves judge what is valuable in their, uh, what they regard as important elements in their well-being. Uh, but the, uh, it throws away completely the idea that uh, you simply add up utilities. This is a uh, an idea which he's expanded in a number of writings, but and which is beginning to attract more and more attention, and will I predict in five or six years enter into textbooks? But it is still a very vague and slightly non-operational idea. Right? There have been great arguments about whether. Uh, some uh, supporters of said advocate that he should really specify exactly what capabilities are implied that is to set out the list of them uh, which, he ha which he resists doing uh, on the grounds that it is not up to me to set out the list it's up to the individuals themselves this sounds very in itself very utilitarian but he is a consistent critic of utilitarianism and he uh, particularly repudiates the idea that social welfare is simply the sum total of individual welfare. Okay, I, I, this is just to intimidate you with uh, how complicated this idea is. Uh, and, I, and I certainly don't think that uh, the last word has been said. And I cannot give you a satisfactory single reference. But it is... Uh, He's a Nobel Prize winner, and uh, uh, the idea, the capability approach has attracted a growing literature. Uh, finally, the fifth is a much more interesting and kind of teasy idea, which, which is enormously influential, particularly uh, by Chicago economists, which is that the first theorem, first best Pareto optimality, uh, while certainly a formal theorem, in some mysterious way is, to, is a good approximation of what the world is really like. I call this the good approximation assumption, which is simply says that the competitive outcomes that you observe in the real world is more nearly, it's not exactly a parade of optimality, it's not exactly first best efficiency, but it's a pretty good approximation to it. You find this idea best expressed in the writings of Milton Friedman. Uh, his wonderful little book, Capitalism and Freedom, says it, states it over and over again. And if you ask, well, how does he know? He doesn't know, that is his judgment. Uh, it appears in his writings, it appears in the writings of George Stigler and many, and many other Chicago economists who uh, simply almost regard it as obvious and therefore do not really discuss how you could ever discover it. It is a very good question whether such a judgment is justified or not. It received a terrible shock uh, from another theorem, the so-called Lipsy and Lancaster theory of general theory of the second best. 
incentive effects that uh, do not alter people's economic behavior and therefore allow you to arrive at the first fundamental theorem at Pareto optimal allocation uh, you have you because by a lump sum transfer you have divorced in a popular say efficiency from equity you have separated the efficient allocation of resources from the equitable distribution of income and the immediate question arises how this is one of these yes in principle you can make lump sum transfers how do you actually do it in practice I mean what would be a lump sum transfer now when Harold Hotelling announced this idea basically stated the second fundamental theorem uh, in 1938 see everything happens in the 1930s this was this was the great decade in the history of economic thought in which not only did you get Keynesian economics, not only did you get the rise of econometrics, not only did you get national income accounting, but, but virtually everything we've been talking about in welfare economics happened in the 1930s. And uh, the article by Hotelling in 1938 uh, planted this idea of the possibility of redistributing income without affecting people's efficiency and therefore sort of the state would be able to leap almost immediately to the efficient result implied by the first fundamental theorem how telling crazily enough to us said oh an income tax would be a lump sum transfer well uh, anybody knows that an income tax is the one kind of tax which certainly affects people's incentives, people's economic behavior. Uh, he went, he was immediately corrected and changed it to a profit tax, but a profit tax is, like, is likewise not a, uh, a, a proper lump sum transfer. And in fact, the first thing one thinks of is uh, a poll tax. I mean, a poll tax would be, uh, which is an equal tax on every individual, and since it applies to every individual equally, one might think it's the perfect example of a tax that will leave everything the same, uh, will not affect economic behavior. Well, Mrs. Thatcher, the conservative prime minister, was talked into uh, the idea that a poll tax would be if not in a, a lump sum tax, a, a, fee, a politically feasible tax, uh, and it, it probably was the reason for her demise, it, within a few years, the, the census of population in Britain reported a reduction of almost 5% in the population of the, uh, the British Isles as more and more youngsters literally moved from addresses in order to collect the poll tax you had to know the tax authorities had to know the address uh, of the uh, person charged with the poll tax and the easiest way to avoid the poll tax was simply to, to move your residence without leaving a forwarding address and about 5% of the British population literally disappeared overnight to avoid paying the poll tax and they had to extrapolate the population census from previous observations in order to estimate uh, the population of Britain. This shows how even a poll tax uh, has a, can have a considerable effect on economic behavior. And by the way, everything goes back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith always, in Book 5 of the Wealth of Nations, which is all about public finance and about taxation, said that the one tax that the government should always avoid is the poll tax. Uh, and uh, it's politically onerous to collect the poll tax. Well, uh, the, if, it's, if a lump sum tax is not a 
income tax, not a profit tax, it's not a poll tax. What about a random levy on people? Now, that's a, a princi- in principle, a random levy means that we pick some characteristic of agents, which is purely random, which has nothing to do with their economic behavior. Uh, the, an example I give is uh, people whose last name starts with a vowel instead of a consonant. Uh, anyone uh, whose last name starts with a vowel will pay a tax, and anyone whose last name starts with a consonant will not pay a tax, may even get a subsidy. That seems to be uh, totally random, and furthermore, couldn't possibly affect the economic behavior because you cannot alter your name. Uh, and so it should be a perfect example of a practical example of a, a lump sum transfer. And the only problem with it is that the moment you think about it, it's politically infeasible. I mean, no government would ever uh, pass such a tax law because there would be an outcry of people whose names started in a particular way. It's totally unfair. And uh, governments have to worry, even with random levels, whether they are politically acceptable. And a lump sum transfer which is politically unacceptable uh, is not a practical example of how you can transfer income in order to reach the first best theorem. So, I conclude from this, I conclude from this, all welfare economists conclude from this, all public economists agree that lump sum transfers are, politi- are practically, are totally impractical. That one cannot imagine, one cannot think of a single example of a lump sum transfer. Uh, it is not possible to redistribute income in such a way as to preserve uh, the efficiency result of the first best theorem that you wish to preserve in order to alter the distribution of income without effect having any incentive effect on individual behavior. So, what is the second fundamental theorem then? Oh, it's just, it is what Ronald Coase once called blackboard economics. It's the kind of thing which you can write on the blackboard. We did it in words. But it, it cannot be implemented. It, it doesn't exist outside of the window of a classroom. It has no practical import. And it raises the interesting question, why do economists state theorems that seem to be uh, applied mathematics? Very interesting to a math department, but it's very difficult to understand why... No, it's not difficult to understand. It's, it's sinister to understand why economists go in for theorems that are only mathematically interesting and have no economic import. So... I think these mathematical theorems have the genesis in this first 
I think like most sciences, whether it's economics, physics, the idea is that you seek a deeper understanding of an important observed phenomenon. And I think that these theorems by the 1950s might argue that they can usefully repeat in some regular instance. We're driven by the idea that <coughs> one wanted in a formal, logical, quasi precise way to understand this best we mere human beings with all our influential constraints upon us to achieve. And to that extent, I rather yeah. admire the theorems. So like you, I think that someone who then says, well, let's turn it right around again and say that these theorems have a new way of thinkability to real economies is someone in need of the Levant or something. Similar. But I, I don't I think it is a straw man argument to attack the theorems themselves because some misguided individuals seek to disappoint them. And that seems to be behind a lot of the provocation uh, that you've been uh, issuing. And I might add, I enjoy it. But I think it's time for a challenge on this. <laughs> what do you have to say? I well I would direct your um, attention to a number of examples cited in my paper of uh, leading textbooks that uh, recommend these theorems as in fact the intellectual muscle behind the defense of uh, capitalism, free markets uh, and this is precisely what I have been questioning. I agree with you. You agree with me then? Let's that not denigrate the theorems. Oh, not denigrate the theorems themselves. Well, but they I, I've been denigrating economists who profess these theorems. I don't know what you mean by denigrate the theorems themselves. The theorems themselves uh, are mathematical theorems which have very little mathematical interest. The only reason they're interesting to economists is presumably because they state some substantive propositions about the economic world. So... Well, um, matter of judgment, which I think is what Mark is going to matter of experiment and history. Well, that's the problem. The underlying things are untestable and unmeasurable. So it does require judgment and introspection, and therefore it will always be open to subjective debate. And somebody can say, you can't prove that, to which somebody has to raise a white flag and say, you're absolutely correct. But it is my best judgment of how the world works. 
the the uh, okay, the, re- the reference to the law and economics movement uh, allows me to just say very quickly one word about another theorem, exactly like the first and second fundamental theorem, the so-called Coase theorem. Now, uh, the Coase theorem, uh, which states that the when transaction costs are zero the final allocation of resources is independent of the initial assignment of property rights in an economy now it just this is an extraordinary assertion which of course is called the Coase theorem despite the fact that Coase never enunciated and in fact repudiated it. He said you cannot observe a world in which transaction costs are zero. Transaction costs are always positive. So why did he even suggest the idea of transaction costs zero transaction costs? Well it is an exact it's an idea exactly like first best Pareto optimal efficiency. It's meant to uh, set a framework thinking about markets in terms of whether transaction costs are large or small I unfortunately didn't really provide a way of measuring transaction costs but nevertheless planted the idea that it is important to think about the level of transaction costs and that's how we explain the existence of firms uh, which was a uh, idea which ne- had never even occurred to most other economists that the existence of business firms requires explanation. Why don't they all buy in whatever services they require? Why why, why are there firms at all? Okay, well, so, uh, the Coase theorem is a uh, a term invented by George Stigler uh, when presented with uh, Coase's ideas about transaction costs. and despite repudiating the notion that there was a Coase theorem, nevertheless the Coase theorem is the foundation of an entire movement in economics called the law and economics movement, which whether you like it or not, is the fastest growing branch of economics in departments of economics in American universities. Every second law student in America is studying law and economics and every third economics student is studying law and economics. Uh, This is really where it's all at. Uh, And the articles and the journals are proliferating uh, and it's all based on the idea of the Coase theorem. Uh, And the, uh, the patron saint of the law and economics movement is Richard Posner. Uh, the author of the economic analysis of law who is to the law and economics movement what Samuelson was to economics I mean the law, uh, Poster's book uh, the uh, economics of law uh, is I think already in its sixth or seventh edition uh, and it it gets right down to does he mention the first fundamental theorem no does he mention the second fundamental theorem? No. Okay, cut that down to three minutes. The wealth max- he posed the cause of the wealth maximization hypothesis. He, he argues that the common law actually maximizes wealth, meaning income as an unintended consequence and, and, and judges uh, he is himself a, uh, a a judge in an appellate court and he argues American judges uh, without intending to always reach decisions that maximize the income that they, they, they enact so to speak the first fundamental theorem without knowing it 
That's the wealth maximization hypothesis. Now, he is an extremely clever uh, economist who knows perfectly well that it all depends on whether you can, whether you can really divorce if income efficiency from equity, whether the, you not only have the first fundamental theorem, but you also have the second fundamental theorem. And so he says, oh well, when he, transaction costs are never zero, so you never have the pure cost theorem, but if they are sufficiently small, if transaction costs are low, then you get a result that is very much like the first fundamental theorem. You see, this is very close to, in fact, virtually the same as the good approximation assumption. If transaction costs are not zero, and if there are no uh, legal restrictions on bargaining, then the cost theorem is a kind of uh, virtually a tautology. If people can bargain efficiency, they will bargain efficiency. Uh, and the gainers will compensate the losers. Uh, the whole question is, of course, yes, but are the gainers and losers, do they have access, an equal access to credit? The idea of a perfect capital market is, is very rarely understood how important this is to the cost theorem and to the second fundamental theorem. In a perfect capital market, anybody can go to the bank and borrow as much as they want at the competitive market rate of interest. If, if there's credit rationing, if you, can, if you and I cannot actually walk into a bank and borrow as much as we want at the going rate of interest, then of course, if we are one of the gainers, then we cannot compensate uh, the losers because you may not be able to get access to credit to compensate the losers. So the cost theorem requires the idea of perfect capital markets, which lies behind the second fundamental theorem. The cost theorem is exactly, is really the first and second fundamental theorem stripped down and has the same objection, in my view, as the first and second fundamental theorem. And it's just a theorem you can write on a blackboard, but it's almost impossible to find any practical implementation of it. And I have now exceeded the three minutes that I am allowed. Uh, and, I th and I thank you very much. Let me say one last thing. I think, um, I think it's, uh, everybody in this room recognizes that you're clearly wrong about something that you said. And that's that it was foolish to have you come down here as a person. <laughs> so thank you very much for a very provocative talk.